Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and as your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered right. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him, and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do
meaning his son, Jesus Christ. After that, the next greatest gift that God gives to us is the priesthood. That's something. Right after the gift of his only begotten son, St. John ranks the gift of the priesthood as the second greatest gift. Why is that? Of all the things which God has bestowed on us, why is it that St. John counts the gift of the priesthood the second best? We certainly know why it's not the first best. The first is Jesus Christ and salvation in him. Then comes the priesthood. One thing I can assure you is it has nothing to do with the men who are made priests. If anything, God chooses what the world would consider unworthy. He chooses the weak. So that their strength is only found in their Savior. Like Moses, who, by the way, stuttered or listened and complained when God told him to go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh such and such, he said, but I don't speak well. So too God chooses men who aren't very eloquent so that he can make them eloquent by the gift of his Holy Spirit. He chooses men who are not very attractive in the eyes of the world, so that their true beauty can be seen when they are clothed in the grace of God. So it has nothing to do with the worthiness of the men. And that which I am about to say and preach upon comes strictly as a gift from God to you, to us, to his church. Remember, that's what St. John said. He didn't say the second highest calling is the priesthood. He said the second highest gift, the second most important gift that God the Father gave to the church is the priesthood, and this is why. There is but one priest, the one who stands and offers before God the Father, and that is his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, the one and only High Priest. And if you notice on the throne, it's not a picture of Bishop Basil or Metropolitan Joseph. It's an icon of Jesus Christ. And it's upon every bishop's throne in the world. An icon of Jesus Christ vested as a bishop, as our high priest. He calls men of his own choosing, and for his own reasons then, to share in his one priesthood. None of us chose to be a priest. And our Savior reminds us when he says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you and sent you. So unlike every other vocation, job, one doesn't apply for it. One is called to it. You know, often we hear people on TV, these evangelists, the so-called evangelists, speak about God talking with them or laying something on their hearts and they heard him say something. That's God. <laughs> I hope you answer. <laughs> you know, the danger with that, 
not the telephone, the danger with people saying they hear God speaking with them might be God, I don't know. But the danger is there's no way to test that. And we're counseled in Scripture to test the spirits, not to trust every spirit that comes to us. It could be an evil spirit. We know that Satan can even appear as an angel of light. We need something that tests the spirit. For us Orthodox Christians, we believe that the church, as St. Paul describes her, is the body of Christ. That there's one head, and that head is the person, Jesus Christ. But each one of us, whether we're male or female, skinny, fat, whether we're black or we're white, each one of us is a member of that body. One's a little finger and one's a little fingernail and one's a knuckle and one is this, one is that. We're all members of the body. And the church, without all of us, would be incomplete. So we make up the body of Christ, according to St. Paul. And the body has a voice which speaks. And that's how we know that when we hear the voice of God speaking to us, to our hearts, or perhaps audibly to our ears, in our ears, we know that it is indeed the voice of God when it's spoken by the church. What do I mean by that? George, whom we're going to ordain in just a few moments, was called by God. I have no doubt about that. His parents know that from when he was young. His family knows that. His wife knows that. You, among whom he was raised, know that. You see, you speak the voice of God. When you heard that George was being prepared for ordination by going to the seminary, none of you fainted. was a natural thing. You knew it was coming. Because you are the body of Christ. And the voice that he heard was not disincarnate. It didn't just come out of the blue. It came from a body. Your encouragement, your prayers, your recognition in him, even as a child, that he was called to serve God was the voice of God speaking through his body, the church. And that we don't need to test. <clears throat> through this young man whom you're not going to call George anymore he's Father George before I go on let me tell a little vignette from my own ordination and those of you who were at Father Gabriel's ordination probably heard this so forgive me after I was ordained my grandmother Suttu came up before the entire family after the liturgy, they were all there. My mother, my father, my sisters, my godmother, aunts, uncles, cousins by the dozens, right? Everyone was there. And little Suttu came up, who stood about this tall, and grabbed my right hand. And she said, look, I changed his diapers when he was a child. I've known him since before he was born. She says, but I don't call him by his name anymore. If I can call him Father Basil and kiss his hand, and she kissed my hand. She said, each of you, call him Father Basil and kiss his hand. You don't shake his hand, you ask his blessing. So from my suttu to you. <laughs> when you see his mother and his father call him Father George, and they will. If they can call him Father George, you can call him Father George. If they can ask his blessing and kiss his hand, which they will, you'll see the first ones. So can you. Because through those hands, God will work wonders for you. This is the gift of the priesthood. Through Father George's hands, you will be fed with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Through Father George's hands, after you confess, his hands will be laid on your head and your sins will be forgiven. If you have a problem with that, take it up with our Lord. He's the one who said, Whosoever sins he forgives will be forgiven. 
Whosoever sins he retains will be retained. Y'all who want to go just directly to Jesus, go ahead, go. But he said, I gave it to my apostles. And these men standing here are the successors to his holy apostles. Through those hands of Father George, an infant, and in a few months his own infant, will go into a font as a son or daughter, but we know it's a son this way, <laughs> will go into the font as a son of Adam and Eve and come out of the font a son of God by Father George's hands, his own son, will become the son of God. Two young people will come before him to be wed, and by his prayers and by his blessings and supplications to God, those two will become one. No matter what our eyes see, our Lord assures us that they become one flesh. By Father George. Not by y'all. Not by a judge. But by a young priest. He could do it right after liturgy today. It doesn't come with age. It comes with the grace of the priesthood. See, that's the great grace that God gives to the men he chooses to give to you so that his grace is poured out upon you not just spiritually but physically and such young men <coughs> God calling me to be brief. I'll be brief. <laughs> Such young men don't come out of the blue. They are prepared for the priesthood. And I don't mean the seminary education. I mean the homes in which they are raised. Who taught George to make the sign of the cross? I'll bet everything it was on the Sunday school teacher. Before he came from home, he knew how to make the sign of the cross. Who taught him how to pray the Lord's Prayer? It wasn't in Sunday school. He knew it before he came because they prayed at home. He, like all of the young men who come for ordination, are prepared. And they are also prepared by the congregations from which they came. You all shared in that preparation this day of George. Whether you knew it or not, Every kind word you spoke to him over these years. And if you never spoke a word to him, every time you smiled at him, you were preparing him. It's like we prepare and offer at the table of God, somebody did it this morning, a loaf of it abandoned, right? It doesn't come out of a machine. Somebody prepares that. And then it is offered to God, and he sends it back to us different. It looks the same, it smells the same, it tastes the same, but it comes back to us as the body of Christ. Today this family, his parents, his blood family, his wife and her family, this whole congregation offers George as an urbani today. And you'll see he'll walk at the end of the great entrance not carrying the gifts as a deacon normally would, but covered with the air, the big veil that we use to cover the gifts. Because he is your gift today. He is the urbani, the oblation that's being offered to God this day. After the ordination, he's going to look the same. It's like the bread looks the same. He's going to smell the same, whatever cologne or aftershave he puts on, it's still going to be there. He's going to sound the same, but he will not be the same. He will be a priest of the Most High God. And the saints of our church tell us, if you have eyes pure enough to see it, like the eyes of a child who can see it, George will be like a burning torch. He will be touched by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
that he might die to his old self and live now to God. I want you to listen to one particular part of the ordination service which normally you would miss, but I'm going to tell you about it now so you don't miss it. And we're going to ask Dr. Bill in the choir to sing It Is Truly Me very softly today, really very softly so the congregation can hear these words. For me, they're the most moving part of an ordination service. After the young man has received the Holy Spirit, after you have assured us that he's worthy by proclaiming him worthy, I will call him to the front of the holy table. And he'll put his hands right over left, just like you do when you come for a blessing. And I will give him a charge. And this is the most important charge given to the priest. I'll speak it into my microphone. They'll speak, sing softly so you can hear it. It's a very serious charge. Metropolitan Philip gave it to me when he ordained me as a priest. Metropolitan Anthony Bashir gave it to Metropolitan Philip when he ordained him. Metropolitan Theodosius later, Patriarch Theodosius, said those same words to Metropolitan Anthony when he ordained him a priest, and so on and so on. These are the words. standing here and I take the lamb, the bread now become body of Christ and I put it in George's hands, no longer just on that dish of gold it's nice, but George's hands are better we'll put the lamb in George's hands with these words receive thou this pledge and preserve it whole and unharmed until thy last breath for thou shalt be held to an accounting thereof at the second and fearful coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That tells us with what care priests need show or give to the Lamb of God, to the body of Christ. In the language of the world, we speak of the crumbs right from the bread, but in the language of the church, the lamb has no crumbs, it has pearls. Each one of those little crumbs we call a pearl. And he will be held accountable, just like I will be and every man ordained a priest will be held accountable for every single pearl that we consecrate during our priesthood. It's not just the pearls of the bread become body of Christ. You see, you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a pearl. Sounds better than a crumb, right? <laughs> each one of you is a pearl. And your priests on the great and last day will be held accountable for you too. Not just for the pearl of the bread, but for you who are also pearls of the body of Christ. This is the gift, the sacrifice that George makes this day. His family and his congregation makes the sacrifice of George, but George makes this sacrifice, that on that great and last day he will be judged not only for his own self, like you will. Nobody's going to ask you to account for your wife's sins, your husband's sins, your children's, just your own sins. But when a priest goes to stand before the judgment seat, he has to also answer for the people for whom he served as priest. God might say, okay, George, you did well. But how about John? You remember him? He sat in the last row in the church. He never came to coffee hour. And after a while, he stopped coming to church, and nobody, including you, missed him? Ooh. Ooh. Or how about Hafiza? She was sick. She had no family. But you went every day to visit her. Well done. You see what a priest sacrifices for you? He can sacrifice not only his time and his family's time, which is bad enough, but he lays down his own soul for you. That's the love with which priests love their people. So today's a day to give a gift to your priest 
and most especially to the new one. I'm not talking about money, that might be nice. Or a new clergy shirt or a new set of vestments, that's nice and very much appreciated. But the most important gift you can give any priest, but most especially your own priest, is that you lead a Christian life. So that when he does go to stand before the fearful judgment seat of Christ, you'll be counted as a good defense for him. Not as a cause for his condemnation, but as a good defense. And many decades from now, when that old priest, George Katrib, goes to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, And our Savior reads the names of all of those people who were entrusted to his pastoral care. Hundreds, thousands by that time. When he gets to the last one, may that old priest, Father George, hear words from our Savior. Well done, Abraham. Well done. Enter into the joy of your Lord. May God be gracious to this young man to his wife, and to his entire family. May God reward all of you for this great gift of a young man that you are offering this day in the Holy Priesthood. Listen for those words. It's a frightening charge, but it's what the priesthood is all about. Receive thou this pledge. To our good God, the Father, who gave us salvation in his Son, Jesus Christ, who is the great high priest, and to the all Holy Spirit, which will descend with mighty power this day and fill this holy house and this young man with his divine grace, be glory, dominion, and might now and for all, all ages. Amen. Amen.